The sheer force of the German spring offensive in 1918 had stunned the British, pushing them back almost to Amiens before they could stop the Germans at the outskirts of the city. Amiens, as a logistic centre and railway hub, was vital to the British war effort and had to be held. The Germans captured the neighbouring village of villiers bretonneau and Amiens was bombed. But the German supply lines were stretched too thin to capitalise on their success, and a British-Australian counterattack drove them away. But the Germans weren't finished. On April 24th, a German A7V tank appeared and broke through the British defensive lines, threatening Amiens. Three British Mark IV tanks challenged it in the first tank-on-tank -tank battle in history and held them at bay long enough for a squadron of Whippet tanks to appear. They drove off the Germans and the Amiens sector was saved. The shadowy depths of the Argonne Forest provided the setting for the Meuse-Argonne offensive. This was part of the final Allied offensive that ended with the armistice on November 11, 1918. Its objective was to take the railway hub at Sedan, breaking the German supply network to France and Belgium. It would be no easy task. The deep forest was a labyrinth, teeming with German machine gun defences. And while there were well over a million American troops attacking, they were inexperienced and would face nearly half a million dug-in Germans, battle-hardened and resolved to hold their ground. The Chateau of France were the traditional homes of the nobility. Some resembled villas, others were more like castles. During the war, many of these fell into German hands, which then would serve as luxurious quarters for generals and high-ranking staff. Captured enemy officers and ace pilots enjoying the privileges of rank and title were often housed in these salubrious retreats. However, as the war gathered pace and the front spread, many soon became the scenes of vicious battles. By 1918, many of them were in ruins, much like the old aristocracy itself. Once Italy joined the war, the Italian and Austro-Hungarian navies faced each other across the Adriatic Sea in a deadlock. The Italian navy was superior in numbers and quality, but the Albanian and Dalmatian coastal harbours were better fortified and easier to defend. Both sides concentrated their strategies on fast torpedo and gunboat battles. Highly mobile and able to threaten either navy attempting to leave harbour, they inflicted heavy damage using these raider tactics. Italy developed the MAS, the anti-submarine motorboat. Made of plywood and only useful in calm water, they were still faster than any other warship and carried depth charges, torpedoes and mines. Submarines harassed unwary steamers and seaplanes and torpedo boats harassed submarines. There were coastal raids back and forth on both sides, but it was the Allied naval blockade of the Adriatic that perhaps had the strongest effect on this front. It effectively halted Austrian shipping and prevented them from adequately resupplying their empire, which exacerbated their food and material crisis as the war dragged on. When the Ottoman Empire joined the Central Powers in early November 1914, the British Empire feared for the security of its oil wells, pipelines and refinery at Abadan near the Persian Gulf. They moved to capture the Ottoman-controlled Al Four Peninsula, and the ancient fortress of Fal was the main Ottoman stronghold there. Within days of the Ottomans joining the war, a British naval fleet was in position, and a joint marine attack with the Indian Expeditionary Force was launched. The walls of the fortress were breached by heavy artillery, allowing the Indian-British forces to seize the fortress in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat, taking the port of Fal the next day. This was the first action of the Mesopotamian campaign, which continued until the capture of Baghdad in 1917. The victory relieved all British concerns about the safety of their oil. Monte Grappa occupied a strategic position on the Asaggio Plateau, overlooking the gateway of the plains of Veneto. Whoever controlled its heights controlled the area, and it saw its share of battles during the war. In 1917, the Italians halted the Austrian summer offensive at the very peak, and by December the Austrians had been pushed off the mountain. Further attempts to take the mountain in the spring and summer of 1918 also failed, and Monte Grappa, by then the symbol for Italy's defence, would play a huge part in the final Italian offensive of the war on Vittorio Veneto. Brutal fighting finally forced the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian army and its retreat in late October 1918. 
two-thirds of the casualties of the offensive were inflicted around Montegrappa itself. After the Ottoman Empire failed to take the Suez Canal from the British in early 1915, the British pursued them into the desert, and a new front was created that lasted till the very end of the war. Desert fighting was very different from the battlefields of Europe, but tanks made their appearance even here at the Second Battle of Gaza. The goals were Damascus, Aleppo, and the prevention of an operational Berlin-Baghdad railway for the Central Powers, who had already connected Berlin with Constantinople. The British also helped the Arab revolt against the Ottomans that grew in strength throughout the region. When Damascus fell, the revolt was complete. The lasting result was British control over Palestine and French control over Syria and Lebanon. The lines drawn by this conflict are still in dispute to this day. With Russia out of the war, Germany was free to transfer hundreds of thousands of battle-hardened troops to the Western Front to try to break the stalemate there and hope to win the war through a decisive final victory. The Americans had not yet arrived in force, and the British and French were exhausted from the battles of 1917. It was time to strike. Operation Michael would be the first battle of the new offensive. The plan was to punch through the British Fifth Army and outflank the third near the endless, devastated no-man's land of St Quentin, with the aim of finally capturing the vital Allied railway hub of Amiens. This was to be the mother of all battles. It began with one million artillery shells raining down on the British in five hours. Headquarters, communications and artillery were destroyed. Following the surprise and terror, German stormtroopers overwhelmed the British defences, ripping a gap over 60 kilometres long in their lines. This was only the beginning of the Kaiserschlacht. The importance of the Suez Canal to the British in the war cannot be overstated. Having millions of troops from India, Australia and New Zealand heading to Egypt and Europe, and also British oil from Persia being shipped through the canal, it was a vital supply line. If captured by the Ottoman Empire, it would severely disrupt British troop and supply routes and put the entire eastern Mediterranean in Ottoman hands. In early 1915 they crossed the Sinai Desert to attack the canal. This near-impossible accomplishment was enabled by German engineers going in advance to dig water wells through the desert. When the Ottomans reached the canal, they knew they only had four days to seize it before running out of supplies. Ottoman artillery would be vital for the attack to have any chance of success. And diversionary attacks all along the canal would be launched in the hopes of confusing the defenders. The Ottomans would attack the Suez Canal several times during the war, but never took it. The British counterattacked and pushed the Ottomans back into the Sinai Desert. The two sides in the war were two alliances of empires. The central powers were the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria. The Entente powers, today often referred to as the Allies, were composed of many more nations and featured the British and Russian empires, two of the three largest empires in world history, who ruled more than a third of the world between them. Before the war, though, the alliances had been somewhat different. The Triple Alliance between Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy was counterbalanced by the Franco-Russian alliance, and most people believed that these alliances would prevent war. They were wrong. No other war in history had brought such change so quickly as World War I. It's been said that between 1914 and 1918, the world went from 1870 to 1940. And in many ways it is true. Men rode into war on horses and rode out of it in tanks. In August 1914, Old School met New as infantry marched out en masse in brightly coloured uniforms against machine guns. The New School won. Airships and airplanes sailed the skies, submarines and battleships prowled the seas, and the biggest gun of all, the Paris gun, fired shells that were the first man-made objects to reach the stratosphere. Stormtroops, the creeping barrage, chemical warfare, the psychological warfare of bombing civilians far from the front. These were the hallmarks of the First World War. Even things we take for granted today like the zipper, radio communications, sanitary napkins and soya sausages became everyday conveniences because of the war. And medicine made greater progress in those four years than at any other time or after. As the victors redrew the map after the war, many countries we know today emerged. 
The post-World War was, in every respect, a new world. Despite the 1899 Hague Convention Treaty that banned the military use of poison gases, all major combatants of the war used them at one point or another. Tear gas, chlorine gas, phosgene gas, or the dreaded mustard gas. As the war went on, the chemicals grew even more dastardly. The horrors of chemical warfare caused worldwide public indignation that continued long after the war. In actual fact, chemical weapons were relatively ineffective. Just 3% of those who suffered a gas attack died, but the effects to the eyes and lungs were often long-lasting. It was the families of the victims sent home who watched their loved ones slowly and painfully die over weeks and months who were the hardest hit. As the great empires of Europe went to war, so did their colonies throughout the globe. France brought Zouaves from Africa to Flanders, Britain brought in Canadians, South Africans, Anzacs, Australian and New Zealand army corps, and Gurkhas from India. In Africa, German colonial troops, the Schutztruppe, fought for their existence against Belgium, British, French and Portuguese attackers. Russia brought troops from Siberia to Europe, the Chinese labour corps worked behind the lines on the Western Front, and war flared throughout the Middle East. Millions of men from every corner of the globe fought in what was truly the first World War. Many celebrated names of the 20th century served in the Great War in their youth. Authors such as J.R.R. R. Tolkien and Ernest Hemingway, and the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, to name but a few. For many others, it was the war that made them famous. Matahari, the Red Baron, Edith Cavell, Lawrence of Arabia, and infamous Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, George Patton. There were also those who opposed the war, whose influence on our world would be enormous, Albert Einstein and Vladimir Lenin. It was, to put it simply, an age of heroes and legends in the face of an apocalypse. Flying aces were the rock stars of World War I, knights of the sky, loved and admired around the world, receiving dozens of love letters a day, their pictures adorning the bedroom walls of millions of teenage girls. Their names are immortal. The Red Baron, Billy Bishop, Eddie Rickenbacker, Werner Voss, Oswald Bulk, Albert Ball, Max Immelmann, René Fonck, Georges Gounemer, Charles Nungesser, and more. They were perceived as true gentlemen, fighting man to man, with respect between pilots transcending borders. While that perception may have been somewhat true early in the war, by the later stages it was anything but that. Flying most often in formation and attacking with machine guns, the life expectancy of pilots was frequently measured in hours, and a perfect kill was when the enemy never saw you coming. The war had its origins in Europe, but while there was a lot of fighting within that continent, it was a global conflict from the beginning. At the start of the war, the Japanese Empire was already locking horns with Germany and China and the Pacific Islands. And when the Ottoman Empire, which stretched from the Balkans to the Persian Gulf, joined in late 1914, it truly became a world war. There were naval battles in the South Pacific and South Atlantic. Soldiers from every continent except Antarctica would fight. There were fronts in Persia, Mesopotamia, Libya, even the borders of India, and fighting all over Africa as European colonies changed hands. Towards the end of the war, the United States and Brazil would also join in the fighting. It was the first truly global war and the largest in history at the time. Europe, before the Great War, is often described as tranquil and peaceful. But in the decades before the Great War broke out, there had been Balkan Wars, the Russo-Japanese War, terrorism, assassinations, and increasing demands for civil rights and self-governance throughout the empires. And so, when Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot, at first it barely caused a ripple. In Britain and France, it was seen as just another political assassination in a far-off corner of Europe where things like that happened. It was certainly not a reason to go to war. But all the nations who went to war did have other reasons, and as it turned out, that assassination was the perfect foil to make the dominoes fall. Austria-Hungary wanted an empire to the Mediterranean. Russia wanted influence in the Balkans. Germany feared Russian economic expansion and also wanted a larger global empire. France wanted back the lands it had lost to Prussia. Britain wanted to curb German expansion, especially naval and colonial expansion, while preserving its own worldwide empire. 
Some leaders also saw war as a way to silence the protests and boost nationalism. But it wasn't just political. War was big business. Someone would have to supply the troops to produce the weapons, ammunition and uniforms. Those someones would make fortunes. It's no secret that the war created tens of thousands of millionaires, and it's no secret either that many business leaders urged their governments to war in 1914. Contrary to the stereotype of weeping and waiting at home while their men were away fighting, women served the war effort of their nations in huge numbers. They were munition factory workers, nurses, airplane mechanics and spies. They were Vera Britton and Matahari. Some risked their lives working with dangerous chemicals for munitions, becoming known as canaries for the yellow tint the sulphur gave their skin. In addition to military work, the percentage of women in the civilian labour force nearly doubled in some nations, but grew in all. And indeed, some even fought at the front. Flora Sanders, Milanka Savic, Helen Ruse, Olga Kokoseva, and of course, the Russian Women's Battalion of Death, led by Maria Bokarevka. They were vital to propaganda efforts, and in many countries the taking on of traditional male roles was the final push toward giving women the vote. Britain, Germany, Russia, Poland, the USA and Austria all granted women suffrage shortly after the war. As the most multicultural of all the great empires, Austria-Hungary had 15 different language versions of its national anthem. While its internal workings, that often valued heritage over ability, left it somewhat in a state of decay by 1914, the empire still dreamed of expanding its influence throughout the Balkans and perhaps one day all the way to Persia. In 1908, Austria-Hungary had annexed Bosnia, making Serbia the next in line, and if Serbia fell, Russia would lose all influence in the Balkan region. In 1914, a quarter of the world was controlled by the British Empire and the colonies were secured by Britain's supreme naval power. At the time, the British army was quite small compared to the other European powers, but it was the only fully professional regular army in Europe, and the soldiers were highly efficient despite their small numbers. Fearing the expansion of German influence, Britain guaranteed Belgium's neutrality, meaning that an attack on Belgium was an attack on Britain and all the corners of the global empire would join the fight. In 1871, France had suffered a humiliating defeat to Prussia and vowed that it would never happen again. To that end, France and Russia were fast allies in the fight to contain German ambitions. France had vastly expanded its rail network. So in case of an attack, soldiers could easily be transported from place to place and indeed did fight the entire war on its own territory. France learned quickly that old ideas did not work in modern war. They lost 28,000 men in a single day, marching in formation in bright red uniforms against German machine guns. For France, the war was a struggle for survival against its most hated enemy. Germany, and especially Kaiser Wilhelm II, dreamed of a greater colonial empire and a greater German hegemony in the concert of Europe. A big concern for Germany was the expansion of the Russian railway system. In 1914, German Chancellor von Bethmann Hollweg stated that within three years, Russia would be able to mobilize troops so quickly that the German advantage in technology would not be able to overcome the Russian advantage in manpower. To win the war, they had to act quickly. What Germany feared was a war on two fronts, so their battle plan was to defeat France and then focus the entire German military might on the Russian Empire. Italy had been an ally of Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but when it broke out in 1914, they claimed that the alliance was only a defensive one and Italy had no obligation to join an offensive war. However, one year later, Italy joined the war siding with the Allies, hoping to reclaim lost Italian lands that were now part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Italian front was characterised by mountains. The amount of soldiers wounded compared to killed was far greater there than other fronts, because stray bullets would splinter the rock into deadly projectiles that were particularly dangerous to eyes and faces. Although the 600-year-old Ottoman Empire was huge, stretching from the Balkans to the Persian Gulf, it was in decay and had lost wars to both Italy and a Balkan alliance in the years preceding the First World War. However, the Ottoman Empire would still prove to be a formidable opponent, with the Young Turks movement and the institution of a constitutional government 
having paved the way for modernization in all aspects of life, including the military. Minister of War Enver Pasha, one of the three Pashas, who basically ran the empire during the war, dreamed of a modern Turkish nation that did not look to the Arab world for guidance, but looked to itself. His dream would one day come true, but he would not live to see it. Russia dreamed of having direct access to the Mediterranean as well as more influence in the Balkans. After losing the war with Japan in 1905, they were determined not to lose face again. When Serbia, Russia's lone ally in the Balkans, was threatened by Austria-Hungary, the Tsar was not going to back down. Many people nowadays think of the Russian army during the war as backward, but while initially it suffered devastating losses, by 1916 it was better equipped and more powerful than ever, and was a true force with which to be reckoned. By 1910, the United States had become the world's leading industrial power. Though they remained neutral for the first few years of the war, American industry and finance played a major role. Initially, American reaction to the war was mixed. While the greatest number of immigrants in the States were from Britain, including Ireland, Germans were second, and there was sympathy for both sides. However, when the war began, Britain cut Germany's transatlantic cable, so all American reports of the war were rooted through Britain, and only what was favourable passed the censors. Also, events like the sinking of the ocean liner Lusitania and the execution of Edith Cavell inflamed the American public, and the war with Germany soon loomed large. The Allies' 100 days offensive began with the Battle of Amiens. Their objective was to capture the vital railway hub at Sedan, beside the Meuse River. This location was vital for the German army to move supplies and support to its forces north of Verdun. The job of taking Sedan fell to the fresh American troops, under the command of General Blackjack Pershing, and to the French. They would supply artillery, tanks, and air support. The Germans held on grimly, but with their reserves dwindling they had no choice but to withdraw. By November 5th, Allied artillery was within range of the railway lines. With 1.2 million American soldiers involved, the Meuse-Argonne offensive is to this day the largest battle in the United States military history. Though a success, it was enormously costly. The fighting in the heavily fortified terrain of the Argonne Forest has been described as hell on earth, and for the Americans, it was the bloodiest battle of the war. The Battle of Caporetto in October 1917 nearly broke Italy. They took 300,000 casualties as German and Austro-Hungarian forces crashed into the Isonzo River Valley. One year later, the situation was different. The German army was in retreat. Bulgaria had surrendered. The Entente was pushing through the Balkans and the Middle East, and the Italian army chief of staff had been sacked for his incompetence and replaced by Armando Diaz. Austria-Hungary was on the verge of collapse, and if Italy was to gain any territory, they would have to act swiftly before the war ended. Diaz launched a final offensive to capture Vittorio Veneto. The fighting was brutal, but eventually the combined Entente forces had the demoralised Austrians in full retreat. They took Trent and Trieste as the Habsburgs' empire began to collapse. The armistice of Villa Giusti took effect on November 4, 1918, and ended warfare on the Italian front, four days after the end of the last bloody battle of the Great War. The German Spring Offensive, also known as the Kaiserschlacht, was a series of German attacks on the Western Front in the spring of 1918. Germany had a manpower advantage over the Allies since Russia had left the war following the revolution but German high command realised that this would disappear as millions of troops began arriving from the USA. If Germany were to win the war, they needed to strike immediately and strike hard. German stormtroops would lead the attack. This was the first use of German tanks and an artillery bombardment so massive it could be heard in London. The Germans broke through the Allied lines, advancing further than anyone had in the West since 1914. But as the weeks went on, they were unable to move supplies and reinforcements forward quickly enough to continue the advance. Though they had made great gains and inflicted devastating casualties on the enemy, they did not achieve final victory, and the German army was left exhausted and depleted. When the modern combustion engine was first developed in the 1880s, few realised how much it would change the global economy. But over the next decades, in every shipyard, it became obvious that oil power was superior to coal in every way. A motor could now reach full power in 30 minutes instead of six hours, 
It required a fraction of the men to run it, and a ship's range increased fourfold. Even before the war, the dreadnoughts of the mighty British Navy had begun to convert to oil power, but oil was to be found far from British shores. Much of the British war effort in the Middle East was to protect British oil supplies, the Suez Canal transport route, and to take or destroy the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, Germany's oil supply line to the Ottoman Empire. As the war progressed, and the airplane, the car, the submarine, and the tank were produced in greater and greater numbers, oil became ever more important. <laughs>